we have a program. We have a guest with us. We have KM6BXZ. Um, some of you may or may not know him. I think a good chunk of you know him, especially those of you who are part of ACS. And I would ask that maybe when we get further down through this meeting, maybe those of you that are a part of ACS, tell us why you're a part of ACS, because I think that's an important thing here. So uh, we're going to hand the floor over to Mr. Bob Hawkins. Bob, take her away. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's been about three years since I've visited in this capacity anyway with, uh, with the Benicia Club. And uh, so this is a slightly updated presentation, but what I wanted to go through, um, we'll go through what the ACS mission is, what we do, talk about a little bit about the skills that we work on and um, all the cool equipment that we've got little bit about how we get activated, some of the things we have done, and then kind of wrap it up with, you know, folks, if you want to visit ACS meetings, we, we always welcome guests with some few exceptions, and then how to actually join ACS. And it is good to see, you know, quite a few, Benicia's always had um, a really strong contingent in ACS, probably a good 30%, I'd say, ACS members at one point. We're in the Benicia Club, if not more. This is the main command vehicle that Solano County operates. It's uh, in the back end, there's a um, kind of a planning room, but in the middle, there's a comm shop and we get to use the comm shop, but it's got uh, one ham radio. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what our mission is, is to support uh, Solano County OES. And so OES is part of the Sheriff's Office um, and really all the, all the volunteer teams offer whatever help the department needs, but it could be administrative management, technical, operational. You know, obviously we hope our support would be in emergency communications. So we are part of the sheriff's office. Um, so we all are sheriff's office volunteers. We work now under the sheriff sergeant that's part of OES. Previously, we did have, um, a sponsor who is the OES technician. Um, when, when Kevin Ives passed, his replacement doesn't necessarily have the same level of skill that Kevin did. So we're working directly with the OES sergeant and she's been a great supporter of the ACS team. And of course, we also get support from the county comm supervisor, uh, Richard, who's uh, extra class ham. In fact, he was just up on Monday and he fixed the digipeter up on Mount Becca. So great support from the county uh, being part of the county team. So I don't know if you guys remember races from your tests, probably the technician test. You know, we had a question on races. Races, we are a, the Radio Amateur Civilian Emergency Service. Um, if, if there ever were a situation that the War Powers Act was invoked, the ACS members would be the folks that could use amateur radio. Um, but since, you know, that's not likely to happen, uh, ACS is really kind of the contemporary successor to what races used to be. And we primarily just operate under the amateur uh, radio rules when we're using amateur radios, obviously. So it's important though, I think to recognize we're, we're not a radio club. Uh, we're not associated with the ARRL. We're not associated with ARIES. You know, all those things are great resources. And, you know, we definitely encourage um, membership in the clubs. You know, usually when we're doing our regular meetings, we always have an opportunity for club representatives to um, talk about what their clubs are doing. Um, you know, so we, we definitely support the clubs. And if, you know, and if it, if we did have an active areas group in our in our area, which we really don't, um, you know, we certainly could work with Aries. Um, and I know a lot of folks probably in Venetia Club, and I'm definitely definitely in the East Bay Aries, although it's not very active. Um, but I'm also in Sac Valley Aries, which is more active. So there's definitely um, crossover skills that you can gain from being part of that group. But we are disaster service workers. And I think that's something we share in common with uh, a lot of the members of the Venetia Club because you're all disaster worker, well, 
quite a few of you are disaster workers within the city of Benicia. And so that's a really great program in terms of protecting us when we respond to disasters. And in the case of ACS, it also covers us for all of our pre-approved training. So when ACS, when we do training, you know, I usually submit a training plan to the OES sergeant. She'll approve it. We'll put it in our uh, volunteer tracking system. And then that gives us uh, workman's comp benefits if anybody were to get injured during training. So it's a, it is a really good program and it's something we really work hard to make sure we do correctly. So the kinds of tasks we would hope to get uh, uh, assigned to would be um, support of fire law enforcement, primarily SAR. So we actually have done um, more work worth working with the search and rescue team. And we are operating on the public safety radio band, so it's not amateur radio. Um, we do have uh, quite a substantial and robust radio room with when we, we have a WinLink 2000. And so, you know, we could, if push came to shove, you know, really connect over radio, radio over email over radio using the WinLink system. We also have a federal license, which we got last year. So that allows us to operate on the federal HF bands. No license, no personal license is required, but the station is licensed. So the license actually goes to our radio room. And because we have that federal license, we can operate on the federal frequencies um, at higher speeds when we're doing digital. We don't have a we don't have the same limits that the FCC puts on the amateur band. So that was something we were able to get through OES. We could also do cell phones, regular phones, computer email. I, I don't see us doing that too much. We do have a satellite system, but I think that's pretty, it's pretty self-operating. So, you know, I think mainly if we were ever to be used, it would be, you know, in the radio room in the EOC, but primarily our focus has been helping the search and rescue team. Now we also help the sheriff's office since we are a volunteer team, just like search and rescue and even dive and um, some of the other programs, the cadet programs. When the sheriff's office has an event like the Mayfair or the Solana County Fair, when those are going on, um, we would help um, with both of those activities, even to issuing radios, staffing the command post, things like that. So, you know, we expect everybody that's in ACS to act professionally and we really work through the chain of command. So, you know, we, like I, we're, we're not a club, so there's really no voting on what gets to happen. You know, as the team captain, I'm expected to, you know, work with the team, set the training, do all that. And I work within my chain of command, which is right now is the OES sergeant and everything goes through Sergeant Castillo. So it's a lot different than being in a club. Some of the skills we work on, so basic skills, we train a lot in um, emergency communication and primarily our focus has been tactical, tactical communication, you know, things that you would have experience between uh, within an incident. So field teams running a, running a comm center for, for the incident. So we've been practicing on that, but we've done some message handling, um, and some, you know, net operation type stuff. But again, our focus has been um, the last year or so has been tactical radio communication. You know, we may do things as simple as manage the radios, hand out radios, and we've had ACS members help us with that on a couple of the um, assignments that we've taken. We, you know, we do have folks with the advanced skills, programming, net control. This agile mesh is a, it's a series of uh, surveillance cameras that we have that actually run on a mesh system. And I think you guys are familiar with mesh systems because you had a great presentation earlier this year, um, mesh in terms of, you know, Wi-Fi and um, email connection. Well, this is kind of a same principle, but it's uh, primarily video, but it's on the 4.9 public safety frequencies. And it's been fun using that because you do get to, to learn a lot of the concepts of how mesh systems work, um, at least in terms of setup and signal strength and that sort of stuff. So those are some of the skills we work on. 
as part of our training, we meet once a month. And so we usually have training on uh, skills or presentations on different aspects of emergency communication. Um, one of the things we did this spring is we did a three, uh, three, three meeting session on radio operator, which is uh, basically a fire position uh, out of the um, fire service. But when we do tactical communication, we end up following the, the procedures that radio operators use on fires. And so we basically went through the task book or went through the um, job, what they call a job aid, which is kind of a, you know, the user manual, so to speak, and uh, had a session where folks could learn the different procedures to be a radio operator. The other thing we did oh, several years ago is went through and looked around the county and came up with a, kind of a basic frequency plan so that we knew, so that everybody would try to have the same frequencies programmed into their radio so that if we responded within the county, um, we would, you know, we wouldn't have to be programming our amateur radios. So it's not every, <clears throat> it's just not every repeater you can hit in the county, but it's every repeater uh, for, for folks that had permission to use them pretty much. You know, obviously we've got the Benicia repeaters, the Benicia simplex channels, same thing on Vallejo. Same thing on the VACA side. Um, Vacaville's got a VHF and a UHF repeater that we can access. And then of course, uh, K6SOL is the um, ACS repeater. And uh, so we have a few simplex channels in there and we have the VHF calling channel and the UHF call. So those are our, kind of our basic 18. We've really expanded this. We've, it's now up to 60, frequencies because we've added every adjacent county. So we've looked to every county around us and programmed in primarily the frequencies that we we could figure were gonna be used by their either their ARIES groups or their ACS group. And so the full list is 60. And then um, even beyond that, we've got um, NAPA, we have the full NAPA CERT package that we've made available to folks if they want to put that in their radio. So here's some of the stuff that we've got. It's a picture of our radio room. All these gentlemen are um, rough in the in the middle of Silent Key now. Um, the other two, Lee, you might have might recognize George Votlin from Rio Vista. George and Lee are still around. They were the they were the emergency services net crew. We have a Wednesday morning statewide emergency services net. It's a closed net for all the OES um, affiliated amateur radio stations. So it includes Caltrans, a bunch of different state departments, um, but Caltrans is probably the biggest. But there's also federal agencies that call in and then all the county uh, operational areas. So that's our radio room. We have um, Two HF radios, the Canwoods, they, we, we got them jailbroken so that we can operate on the federal frequencies. We have uh, public service radio. We have a digital um, VHF radio. Uh, we have both Winlink packet and Pactor. So we got a Pactor modem. We can operate on the federal side, Pactor 4. And then if FCC operated, you know, if gave us permission, we could operate on Pactor 4 which is just a higher speed digital transmission. Um, so all the OES vehicles have uh, ham radios in them. We also help manage the OES radio cache. So we've got quite a few handheld radios now. We have two boxes of um, the basic Motorola radios that we, that we would typically hand out, but they just got two brand new caches of the fancy APX 8000 tri-band public safety radios, um, quite, quite a purchase. We also have a vehicle we call the Ops Trailer. It has um, two ham stations and two public safety stations, a plotter, several computers, um, workstation, you know, work tables. So it's used primarily by search and rescue. And now it's also used by um, animal control when we respond. 
for disasters. So that's that's a quite capable piece of equipment. We have MC1, which is the big motorhome I showed you. Um, we also have a public safety portable repeater, which is kind of fun to set up, but we'll have a picture of that. And we have uh, a bunch of RF direction finding kits. So we always have fun playing with those. And then of course we have our uh, 440 repeater up on Cement Hill. So the county has been very supportive of um, you know, amateur radio and having that all in place. So if we were to get activated, they would do it under the emergency operation plan. Um, you know, I definitely don't want to oversell how much we get activated because we really haven't been used um, even during the big disasters. It's been kind of disappointing. But, uh, you know, I definitely think they know that we're available. We just haven't had any large scale communication failures. And so, you know, the trick is, you know, ham radio and all else fails. Well, if nothing else fails, that they're not thinking about using ham radio because everything's still operational. But we're available, we're practicing, we're training, you know, just like Benicia, just like you guys do for the city. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we try to keep busy helping other teams. Now, this is a picture of uh, our chipper sitting inside of MC1. So it's mainly public service radio or public safety radios. There's an 8900 kind of right above his hat. That's the only ham radio, but it's got a quite a nice computer dis, uh, computer console, dispatching system, foot pedals, you know, headsets, the whole bit. But um, and this was an actual search that we were helping uh, tracking teams. So that's kind of what we could get tasked with, and in real situations, again, search and rescues are our best um, best opportunity to go out and and help. You know, we do focus mostly on the incident side of things. You know, on the amateur radio side, folks are used to the different types of nets that can happen during an emergency. But on our side, we're primarily working tactical nets. We, we definitely could work on a command net because we do have the radio room and we could serve as a connection really to the state, op the state emergency operations center. And that's kind of what we're here. You know, the support logistics camp net we could do all those things, but I think mainly if, as long as we're practiced on tactical, um, you know, we're, we're prepared to kind of handle anything. And on the incident side, it's interesting, we run open nets. You know, when you're on the amateur side, folks typically are used to directed nets. So there's a difference in how we do things over an ACS. We are big on communication logs. So when we're operating in a net control capacity, we we log all traffic. So we usually have a uh, somebody on the radio and we try to have a scribe and we try to have a runner. So we'll try to have three people at a minimum, um, but at least two. And then if there's just one person, we hope there's not a lot of traffic because it's <laughs> hard to log everything. But Search and Rescue has their own log that we use. It's called SAR 133. For the rest of the incidents, you know, we are really big on the incident command system, and there's a radio log ICS 309 that we that we use. So again, we're, you know, practice logging, practice running tactical nets. So here's here's a setup. We were helping on the the search and rescue field training that they do at, at Rockville Park. On the left, that's our tactical repeater. Um, we have a Kind of a military grade antenna system called blue sky mass it's really the mass with a you know just a regular two meter antenna on top but it, it is a portable tactical repeater it's got a solar power uh, battery and you could hook it up to a gener generator but on a sunny day like that you know it'll run all day without any any trouble we also have a go kit that's again that's art sitting in front of our go kit it's a uh, we have a 8,800 on the top, we have a Motorola, oh, I can't remember the model number, 2,500 something on the bottom. So we have public safety and amateur radio. And it actually kind of came in handy because the public safety radios are really only, you can only watch one band at a time or one frequency at a time. So we had the 8,800, we were monitoring a couple different um, public safety frequencies as well as um, 
our own amateur repeater. And that's that's the search and rescue team getting their briefing from Mike Kyle. Some of you guys might know Mike. Um, so this was two years ago, I guess, out at Rockville for that picture on the right. So again, search and rescue, we work really closely with those guys. Um, a lot of members in ACS are also in search, search and rescue. So there's good crossover between the two organizations. Uh, this year we got to work the vaccine clinics. So again, that's something that, you know, we're a volunteer team with the county. So the county was helping with the clinics. So search and rescue and ACS were both helping out. So there's Art with his wand trying to bring a helicopter in, I think, to the auditorium or something. Um, now Art was helping people find their seats. That's me and Brian Lane. You might know Brian. Um, we were actually helping patients come in, sit down, collecting their medical information and getting them all prepped up for the nurse to give them the shot. So <laughs> that was that was quite an experience, but um, a good showing from both ACS and, and search and rescue. Um, one of the other activities we're really trying to push is working with uh, Solano Cart. Now they are they are the animal rescue team. And they work with animal control, which is also part of the sheriff's office. And so they reached out to us early in their process. And I think they've been into the Bark Club a couple of times. I know quite a few of the hams went through your you know, cram class before the uh, COVID situation. So we've been working with them closely on communication training. Uh, we did a couple of sessions with them in, uh, in 2019. Uh, that's Joe Wheeler. He was helping on some uh, horse loading training. So we were actually helping with comms. We did a big drill this year, May 2021, with animal control. And we had ACS supporting communication, both handing out county radios, uh, helping out net control. And then we just did an exercise um, Sunday where we had a couple ACS members help with the, the field teams helping them practice their field communication. And then um, several, of us, several of us who are on ACS actually helped design, design the training. So the CARTs are another uh, area that we, you know, between search and rescue and CART, that's probably our best chance to get deployed during emergencies because we can help them with uh, tactical comms versus, you know, the EOC, which, so far hasn't needed backup communication. So folks can attend our meetings as a guest. Um, you know, both, I think we got Ed and Bob, not to put them on the spot, but they're frequent guests and we you know, love to have them. There's only an occasional meeting if we meet out somewhere where we're uh, at the alternate EOC, which is actually the um, detention center you know, in the cases where we're actually going through vehicles and how to access equipment and all the secret passwords and handshakes and all that stuff. Um, some of those meetings are restricted, but we don't do that very often. So um, like our next meeting, we're gonna meet at OES, we're gonna meet outside, we're gonna break out the brand new APX 8000 radios and we're gonna practice figuring out how to push the buttons and change zones and do all that kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, guests are invited and usually I'll send out a notice. We have our, I include our regular guests and um, make sure they know if they're invited or not to that particular meeting. The biggest limitation with guests, you know, so we've got permission to bring them to regular meetings, but if we were to do an exercise in the field, like say the stuff we do with the carts, um, you actually have to be a member, a foreign member which gets us how to join ACS. Um, so you can submit an application. What that does is it kind of gets you into an interview and then you'll interview with me. We'll decide if you really want to get into ACS, you know, the kind of things we do. Um, and if you were to join, if you were available to participate, there's required training. It's, it's the incident command system, uh, self-paced training, it's all online. ICS 100, 200, 700, and youth protection. They, we have, uh, you know, if you go through that and you think you want to go on with the process, there's a more detailed application packet, sign all kinds of forms. And then the sheriff's office actually does a pretty thorough background check. 
And so they'll check with references, of course, check all the criminal references, that kind of stuff. And then um, once you've actually passed that, they'll run your fingerprints. It costs money to run fingerprints. So they wanna make sure um, there won't be any issues. And then once you've gone through that process, um, then they'll swear you in as a disaster service worker and then you're in ACS. So we've had uh, one or two new members over the last year. It's been kind of tough with COVID. So we have about 20, I'd say between 25 and 30 people on the roster. And um, it's, been like, it's been about that size for the last three, four years. And that's it. So thanks for the invitation. I'd be glad to take questions. Let me, and it would be interesting if Art or any of the other Sue or folks, either Sue or Michelle um, that are in ACS, you know, if they have anything to add, that'd be great. Uh, let's say, I think I've been in ACS uh, uh, for uh, approaching uh, 15 years or more. And I've always felt it's the best place to get training. Uh, um, you know, uh, at every meeting, um, you have an opportunity to be trained. Uh, we also uh, have a great opportunity for hands-on things. Uh, and uh, uh, we've even had, uh, uh, you know, build your own little thing type of, uh, of training that uh, uh, whenever uh, people have participated in, it's often their first time, maybe with a soldering gun or with a, a specialized crimper or special tools uh, that uh, give people a chance to, uh, to use. Uh, so uh, um, uh, I'm looking forward at some point to getting back into it when uh, Sue and I feel safe uh, from, uh, from COVID. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, one of, one of the benefits uh, we embark um, uh, uh, provide to uh, the Benicia Fire Department is uh, they like um, to be able to submit reports that have numbers, numbers that are positive numbers and uh, having people that are in ACS make them look good. Uh, and it gives them reason to spend money on us. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, just about all of us submit our monthly uh, hourly report, but by uh, participating, it's another way we pay back uh, the fire department for um, uh, uh, hosting us. So uh, those that aren't ACS members, uh, if you feel you can pass a background check, uh, I honestly encourage you to do it. It's, uh, um, it's, it's worth your while. I had a question. I had a question. Uh, what is your like list of criteria that activates the ACS? So the county would, would be looking for areas where they're having communication failures that they could use us. Um, that's primarily what the radio room is set up for is the, you know, the, the connection to the state EOC or other area EOCs, um, you know, through the HF system or HF frequencies. Uh, the whole wind link, the reason we're, we've been pushing wind link so hard that Cal State OES is really pushing the wind link system. So when they were pushing us to get a sheriff's license, I mean, that's all the kind of stuff that we're, you know, it's really kind of geared towards the, ma the massive communication failure. But that's not going to happen very often. So what we're kind of pushing ourselves to do is to work with search and rescue and Solano CART. So anytime there's an in-county multi-day search and rescue we're gonna will be activated just kind of bizarre there hasn't been an in-county search and rescue activation in the last two years where they've gone more than a hasty search you know the the one that art i had the picture of art in mc1 that was back in gosh 20 maybe early 2018 um the other opportunity again is the carts so solano cart got activated last year during the fires and um, we had a missed opportunity. And so we've worked really hard to correct that. And so we're pretty tied in with Solano CART. So if they ever get activated in the county, we're, we're pretty certain that we'll get activated with them to help on comms. So that's the kind of thing, you know, it takes that level um, in terms of a disaster. You know, and we're trying to, trying to set it up so that it's, 
maybe not necessarily a communication failure that results in us getting activated, but get in a position where we can help other volunteer teams um, with their tactical comms and free them up to go out in the field. You know, that's the big thing we provide for search and rescue. Put us uh, folks that maybe are not wanting to climb, climb through bushy covered hills in the radio room and let those young kids go crawl over the hills. So, so that's kind of what it would take. And, and again, that's why I say, I don't like to oversell um, the kind of things that we would be activated for, but um, those are the kind of opportunities, you know, I've really been pushing to make sure that we're prepared to, to do. Uh, are there any physical or financial uh, limitations or requirements? No, that's a great question. No, no physical. Um, financially, you know, we supply the shirt, the, that lovely orange polyester shirt. And then um, all we'd ask is that you buy, you know, khaki, well, I call them tactical pants. They're about, you can get them for 20, 21 bucks. So it's not a big, and you know, we just we just want sturdy shoes. You don't have to buy eight inch leather boots or anything. There's not a lot of financial burden on the members. We don't have a, um, although folks can buy like these green shirts like I wear, um, it's not required because when we deploy, we all have the orange shirts other than, you know, bring your own radio, uh, ham radio. I got a question. Sure. Uh, Bob, thanks for a great presentation first. And uh, just curious if other surrounding counties have a similar kind of organization and whether, you know, Solano's, um, you know, talks to them and, and, and whether they're getting deployed or called out much. I'm just kind of curious uh, if you hear much on that. Yeah, that's, you know, it's interesting. Um, when I first got into the leadership, um, you know, I kind of searched around to see what counties did have ACSs. There's, so we're organized under the OES regional system, mutual aid region. So we're part of region two, which covers the, the, a large swath of the coast. So the whole Bay Area, down to Monterey, up to Crescent City. Um, but, you know, even looking at, I know Contra County has an ACS. Um, in fact, you had an ACS uh, person come and speak to you guys a couple of years ago. Michelle would probably remember when that was. Um, so I think Michelle might have been setting the meetings up in those days. Um, I think Alameda has ACS, um, Santa Rosa, but has one. Uh, Napa is really more geared towards CERT, you know, and so those are all the OES regions. We don't really have a good regional ACS coordinator, although I did get an email from somebody who said he was the OES region two leader, and that was the first time in three years. So that gave me a little bit of hope, but, uh, you know, we do work, I'd say we, we coordinate with NAPA only because there's overlap. We have NAPA folks in ACS, I'm in NAPA CART. You know, we do have a lot of overlap there. Now, as you go the other direction, uh, Yolo, Sacramento, San Joaquin. So Yolo Aries, um, I'm a member of, um, pretty good friends with the Sac Valley Section Emergency Coordinator. And so I'm pretty dialed into what's going on over there, but that's a different OES region and their Aries, you know, and although they're tied in with their OES departments, um, their, pro their primary uh, served agency is Red Cross. So it's a little different focus on that side. So that's kind of a long answer. The short answer is, yeah, some counties have them. We don't talk a lot. There's really no coordination at the regional level. Um, and I don't know that Conor Costa from the presentation we heard didn't sound like they were getting deployed much either. Um, is that what you remember, Michelle? Their uh, group had pretty much fizzled. I think the yeah. guy who spoke was actually hadn't had better luck with Martinez. Sir, or, uh, I think that's where he was from. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I do remember that presentation uh, indeed. I, I, I can't remember his name, Michelle, but... Uh, I do remember him being, you know, a little bit like, you know, why aren't they calling us? But anyway, uh, thank you very much. And uh, nice radio room. Who who built that? You know, that's a great art might know that. Um, you know, I'm sure it got assembled over the years. Yeah. Um, art might have more history or either art. They're both uh, 
may offer shipper they've been around a lot longer than i have yeah, um, um mike heil um uh, kevin uh were uh, the primary ones in uh, putting that room together uh i remember when they got the grant it was uh uh you know well into the five figures and they were just so thrilled to be able to spend uh the government's money and put in all top-notch <laughs> equipment uh, it looked very nice yeah well the ken i mean just the two kenwoods were you know they were probably three thousand a piece at the time i would guess the what are they ts 2000s and um, i think this over over 50 grand well that uh, with, no, with the antenna have... the antenna oh, tower and true. uh right uh, uh and the uh, the coax run from yep. the roof uh, down um you know that was a, a pretty big expense yeah that's true i forgot about the antenna we have a step ir beam that we use for voice and then we have a step ir vertical 80 to 80 to 15 probably <laughs> that we're using mainly for the pack for the pack pack right now so yeah they and you know rich i mentioned rich um our county comms he's he probably did a lot of the uh, I'm guessing he might have done some of the work. Um, he does. Is he still work. there? He he's still gonna there? He's going to retire at the end of the month, so I need to work on him and see if he'll volunteer for ACS. <laughs> well, he's uh, yeah, quite a uh, uh, you know quite a quite a talent, uh, uh, quite a, a resource. Both we both of our con our comms guys, the county rich and his uh, his assistant Daryl, both are hams. Rich, of course, is an extra class. Uh, but Daryl, the, the new guy, um, been there a couple of years. He's also very supportive and he's got quite a bit of uh, skill level. He's been military comms, um, you know, comm tech on fire. So we're lucky to have him around too. They're both very supportive. Uh, so Ron Bunch was the person who gave the uh, presentation about oh, okay. life of ACS and Contra Costa. That's right. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> this is art number two. Uh, a couple things that we used to do in the past, I don't know if we'll start doing them again in the future, are providing communications for some uh, uh, bike rides. You know, they have uh, 5K, 25K, and 100K bicycle rides. We've also provided uh, support for uh, the Mayfair and for the Solano County Fair. And the nicest thing about that is that it allows us to rub shoulders with uh, the deputy sheriffs uh, or interact with people that we don't very often see. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be back in the Mayfair business as soon as they have it. Um, and the county fair, you know, both both events, again, went were virtual, at least the Mayfair was virtual. You know, the bike ride was a great event. Um, it was It was the North Bay. A uh, hospital system ran a ride to defeat diabetes, a run to defeat diabetes. I think it was a ride. Um, I think my first year with ACS was their last year for the event. And so they just couldn't sustain it anymore with the changes in staffing. We, we did actually do a drill with the hospital. So in November every year, the hospitals do do their kind of an emergency drill. So it was probably 20... I think in 2019 wasn't last year obviously what well, we actually did support um uh north bay somebody from north bay that's a ham wanted to try to activate uh ham stations at both both back of alley and the fairfield hospital and we did that and that was a one day thing so there are, you know we take advantage of opportunities like that we were working with red cross prior to covid um I don't know if you've talked to Larry Whitney, but their their whole ham program is kind of in a storage room right now. We we try to take advantage of things when we can. Let's hope things get a little bit more back to normal. Well, Bob, thanks very much for your time and for coming out. And I I did have one final question. You said that you needed criminal references. How many references do we need that are criminals? No, uh, no. <laughs> no. Criminal background check. Yeah. Yes. You need you need good references. Let me make let me be clear on that. You need references that are going to say that you're a good citizen. Yep, yep. Yeah, it is pretty funny. The uh, 
in the in the past, that was something that could really hang up a background check is if your references didn't respond. And so I always would tell people, make sure, you know, you've talked to your reference and they know they're going to get contacted and make sure they respond. Now, I think they've actually changed the approach where um, they actually send the references a form. So again, they need to respond, but they have to fill out a form, send it back by email. Um, but in the old olden days, um, four or five years ago, they literally sent somebody around to your neighborhood to talk to your neighbors. And of course, my little cul-de-sac that caused quite a stir when the <laughs> sheriff's deputy's car showed up within the Vacaville jurisdiction asking about me. Yeah, my neighbor came to me and said, uh, several of my neighbors came to me and said, oh, Michelle, we couldn't believe there was a sheriff's officer asking us <laughs> questions. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> came into my little cul-de-sac and of course the house they went to is the registered sex offender across the street so <laughs> that was uh, that really got the neighbors going they're like they're oh, he's over there and he's asking about bob like well, what the heck is going on so but i survived so not no guilt by association so thank you great presentation yes yeah thank you, thank you. great to see you guys all again it'd be great to come back and see y'all in person mm-hmm and uh, without having to wear a mask. So we all look forward to those days, huh? And final question for you, Bob. Sure. If, R R R can you post, post the link uh, to the ACS uh, sign up uh, or the, the volunteer page? Yes, I can, uh, I can uh, get that uh, to everyone. And also I'll add at this point, if, uh, if anyone is interested in going to the uh, to the ACS meeting this coming Monday evening. Um, we, uh, we typically have a uh, carpool that originates from uh, Benicia. So if anybody is interested, uh, uh, let me or our ALS know and, uh, and we can uh, head up there together. That's actually a great question. When are meetings, how frequently, and at what time, to what time typically? So the third Monday of the month um, at 1900 hours and um, like I said the last two or the last meeting was the kind of the first meeting back at OES I think this will probably be the last in person at OES because it'll start getting too dark to hang out around in the parking lot um, so we'll probably go back to zoom for October and November December we take off and then we'll pick it back up in January, but the third Monday of the month, 1900 hours. And the, uh, they meet on, uh, uh, on Clay Street in, uh, uh, in Fairfield, right next to the coroner's office. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You're dying to get in. That's, oh. I just knew somebody was gonna say, I had to resist saying that. So. <laughs>